Um, let me introduce myself first. My name's Ken. I'm the manager at the Cemetery Park. So welcome to Cemetery Park Online. Um, my two colleagues, Susanna and Michelle, are here too. So they're going to be supporting and helping with the talk. But we're very, very proud to um, welcome Sarah Veniard with us today, a garden designer. So she's going to, I'm going to hand over to her shortly and she's going to give her presentation and there'll be lots of time for question and answers. So um, feel free to slam them into the chat as we go through. Uh, as Sarah talks, if something pops in your mind, feel free to ask a question as we go. Um, Susanna and Michelle will do what they can to help as we go through, but whatever we can't deal with, we will pass on to Sarah once she's done her presentation. Um, but um, there is no screen sharing going on today. It's just a, a voice presentation. So we haven't got to worry about the screen annotation. We are recording this. So if you do not want to be seen in the final recording, Please do keep your screens and uh, microphones off, but we are recording it in speaker view, so that helps as well. Um, and I think, and yeah, that's it. We've asked you to keep your speakers off. I think that's everything from me. I'm going to go silent and I'm going to hand over to Sarah. So it is all over to you, Sarah. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Um, lovely to see you all here this evening. Um, thanks for joining us. Um, so this evening I'm going to be talking to you about designing your vegetable patch and also talking about growing wildflowers in your garden as well. So let's start with designing your vegetable patch. Now growing your own vegetables is a wonderful way to provide fresh healthy food for yourself and your loved ones. Now if you've got little ones it's a fantastic way to teach them about where their food comes from and get them interested in sustainable living. Spring is the perfect time to get started as there are many seeds you can sow directly into the soil from March onwards. However, if you are starting later in the year, there is still plenty you can do if you choose young plants and seeds which can be sown over a long season. So to start with, it's really important to choose a good spot in your garden. Most vegetables need a good dose of sunshine to grow well. So offer, offer them the brightest spot in your garden and you are sure to be rewarded. Most sun loving crops will appreciate six hours of sun or more throughout the growing season. Now, if you don't have a super sunny garden, don't worry. There is still some great crops you can try your hand at growing and I'll make some suggestions a little later on what you can try. Make sure they will be sheltered from the wind, avoiding very exposed areas. Young plants are so delicate, so they will be grateful for some protection. Ensure there is easy access to water as well. Your well well-being is just as important as that of your plants, so make sure you don't have too far to carry those heavy watering cans. You can plan for a space exclusively dedicated to your vegetables, or you could incorporate your edibles in with your ornamentals, apply your own style and have fun with your design. Now, if you don't have flower beds, you can, of course, grow your crops in pots. Dedicate an area on your patio to a collection of delicious fruits, vegetables and herbs growing in containers. It will look beautiful and you will still be rewarded with an abundant harvest. So now it's time to think about what you want to grow. I recommend choosing easy to grow varieties with good disease resistance. Seed packets and plant labels will usually include this information, making it easy for you to make your choices. If you only have a small amount of space, growing crops which take up lots of room and which take months and months to bear fruit may not be for you. Instead, choose crops which will provide you with plenty of produce and are relatively speedy to do so. You will feel like you're getting so much more from the experience of growing your own food and you can play with incorporating many more interesting varieties into your plot. So here are a few recommendations of crops I have had great success with in my own garden. Let's start with sugar snap peas. They look wonderful with their curly tendrils and their plump pods and they taste absolutely divine. <laughs> my partner's making me laugh, I'm sorry. Um, so not many of my sugar snap peas, I have to admit, make it into my kitchen as I have such a habit of munching on them freshly picked from the plant when I'm doing my gardening. Next up, celery. I absolutely adore the taste of fresh celery and that crunch is just fantastic. Now when you grow it yourself, you get to enjoy an abundance of delicious celery leaves as well, which are just incredible when added to salads and sandwiches. The flavour is just wonderful. Next up, 
you've got to try your hand at growing tomatoes and have fun with your tomato growing. I have 30 plants in my garden, embracing 10 exciting varieties of all different shapes, sizes, and colors. I can't wait to enjoy multicolored tomato salads drizzled with olive oil and plenty of pepper. I've got many growing in containers and the rest are dotted in amongst my flowers. I also recommend growing kale. Now this nutrient rich plant grows beautifully as a cut and come again crop. I'm growing a variety called Nero de Toscana, which produces lovely long leaves from July or onwards. And be sure to pop in some radish seeds as well. Now these gorgeous little orbs grow so quickly, usually producing a crop in about 10 weeks. They are perfect for interplanting between slower growing vegetables and I must recommend a beautiful variety called Blue and Red Moon which have the most vibrant pink and purple when you cut them open. Definitely incorporate as well some pak choy. Now these Chinese greens grow incredibly well in the garden and they're perfect as a cut and come again leaf and they are just so versatile. I absolutely adore it, adding it to stir fries, steaming it and having it raw and crunchy in salads. Also, try your hand at growing French and runner beans. Now, I love watching the long winding stems reaching up for the sun and curling their way up the canes. They grow very quickly and take up very little space as you are growing on the vertical plane. So once they start producing, ensure you have plenty of space in your freezer as you will be picking beans every day. They are prolific croppers and the beans taste just delicious. Now, if you are planning to grow your crops in pots, as well as the tomatoes and beans I just mentioned, cut and come again salads and greens are a real joy to grow. And if you grow them in pots, you can position them close to your door or window for speedy snipping. Now you can pick spicy salad leaves such as rocket, mitsuna and red mustard and mild varieties like corn salad, purslane and lettuce. And how about incorporating some citrusy sorrel in there as well? Now many fruits will also grow beautifully in pots and picking sweet strawberries from your pots in the summertime is just such a treat. They are also, there are also so many fruit trees that will thrive in a big pot. Cherries, apples, plums and many more. Choose dwarf or semi-dwarf varieties and enjoy the spring blossoms. Make a beautiful edible or ornamental display out of your potted fruit tree. Underplant it with salad leaves, herbs, strawberries or choose some lovely flowers. Now for a less sunny garden, choose shade tolerant crops such as Swiss chard, beetroot, broccoli, spring greens, salad leaves, radishes, kale and broad beans. You're only limited by your imagination and there will still be plenty of vibrant veggies you can grow even if you don't have the sunniest space. Now I urge you to go organic uh, to protect yourself and our native wildlife from harmful chemicals. I have a fully organic, abundant veggie patch, which really thrives. So if I can do it, so can you. Now it's important to check sowing and harvesting times. Now you can plan for year round crops if you're well organized. I recommend following a planting calendar so that you can see the best times to sow seeds, get young plants in the ground and when to harvest your delicious crops. Plan to enjoy harvesting different crops throughout the seasons. As wonderful as it is to have one big elaborate show all at once in the summer, you will be grateful to be enjoying comforting crops as a nitrogorian as well. Pick some quick to harvest varieties so you get some great results early on, such as radishes and salad leaves. Now for super speedy indoor growing, why not try sprouting your own beans and seeds? You'll have delicious sprouts in just a few days, which are amazing in sandwiches and salads, or as a topping for soups and stews. They're incredibly nutritious and so versatile. So the next thing to try is to draw a plan of your garden that you've imagined. Now it's useful to get what you've visualized and planned down on paper. It's great fun drawing your design and you can have fun with applying your own style. Think about spacing and eventual size of your chosen crops. Now you don't want your plants to become too crowded and to compete for nutrients and light. You'll be surprised how much you can pack into a small space as long as it's not too much of a squeeze. Now when positioning your plants on paper, also think about the eventual height of the crops. Make sure a tall plant won't be overshadowing something more petite. 
it will be useful to observe the movement of the sun through your garden throughout the day. Now you can plot it on paper at intervals, for example, 9 a.m., 12 p.m., 3, 6, 9 p.m. And this will really help you to avoid overshadowing little plants. Now it may sound like a lot of work, but it's a really wonderful way to build a positive relationship with your garden to understand what makes it thrive and to engage in the natural environment which surrounds it. So take your time, enjoy every step of the planning process and get excited about the wonderful array of food you will enjoy as the year rolls on. So now I want to talk to you about growing wildflowers, which will make a perfect symbiotic addition to your vegetable patch. Now, incorporating wildflowers into your garden has a very positive impact on the environment. It's a great way to support our native wildlife, and of course they are incredibly beautiful. Now wildflowers provide pollinators such as bees with local food sources. They will also help invite more useful insects into your garden, which can act as natural pest defenses, taking care of any critters attacking your crops. They also provide insects with shelter and places to breathe. Now birds feed on wildflower seeds once they finish their flowering season, providing them with a really important food source as winter approaches. You can find annual, biannual and perennial wildflowers. Now when your annual plants finish flowering, they will set seed and come up again the following year. So they're really wonderful plants that just keep on giving. Now here are a few recommendations of what wildflowers you could include in your garden. I think poppies make such a special addition to any garden. The traditional red poppy, Papaver roes, is just so delicate. It is commonly found in wildflower mixes and is a striking symbol of remembrance. Poppies have distinctive nodding flower buds and fascinating seed heads, which add interest to your garden throughout the seasons. Now, cornflowers are striking blue and they flower for a wonderfully long season as well. Bees adore them and I think they work perfectly in an ornamental or edible display. Foxgloves are just so striking with their large bell flowers, which always have a buzzing bee nestled inside foraging away. Now, primroses, I think, are just a lovely symbol of spring. Their sweet yellow, little yellow flowers transport us to calming walks in the woodland. And finally, beautiful blue borage flowers, which are edible and they make a very pretty addition to salads. They can also be frozen in ice cubes, which look absolutely stunning in a cocktail. Now, how to sow your wild seeds? Just a few steps to get you going. Now, wildflowers do prefer full sun. Um, so I recommend uh, also sowing them between March and April or in September. So you've got two growing windows there. Now weed the area well and rake the soil, sow your seed, and then rake the area lightly after sowing your seeds to protect them from birds um, and protect them from birds with netting. Now keep the soil moist for good germination. You can mix your seeds with a little sand or flour as well so that you can see where you've made your sowings. So I hope you enjoy planning your edible gardens. Be creative, have fun, and be sure to pop a few wildflowers into the mix. So thanks for listening. Now we now have time for a Q&A and I understand some of you may have already submitted some questions during the talk. So perhaps we can start with those. Excellent, thank you, Sarah, that's smashing. Um, the first thing we've got is a comment from Jim, someone we know, um, at another open space we help with, Sweden Ball Gardens. And it's more of a comment and you might have something to say on it. He's put, um, a friend is growing tomatoes for the first time. He's adamant that the soil should be dry. What's your take on that? Um, I, okay, so with your tomato plants, it's important to, um, to have quite reg regulated water. They, if, if they get, um, if they're quite heavily watered and then left to dry out and then heavily watered, they will get really, really stressed. So quite consistent, good watering is important. My, um, tomato plants, I've got so many of them and they certainly appreciate moist soil. Um, they are sun loving plants. Um, but yeah, I think, I think the key with tomato plants is definitely regular watering. I guess that would help with the succulent of the fruit as well, isn't it? You'll get a, a nice juicy tomato. Um, brilliant. Thank you. And then we've sure got, will. um, Kate has asked us what wildflowers are helpful for pest control. My, my, my response would be get some pitcher plants and Venus flytraps 
Yeah. <laughs> that's me being flippant and facetious. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, go, yeah. What are your thoughts on it? Have you got any thoughts on wildflowers good for pest control? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I've got a couple of recommendations. Um, the first um, flower that I would recommend incorporating would be marigolds. Um, marigolds are really fantastic for deterring pests, especially if you're growing food. Um, so if you plant them around your crops, if you pop them in around your leaves and um, they're particularly good a good companion plant for tomatoes as well speaking of tomatoes before so make sure you get some marigolds around there too um, you can in your garden use um, some plants as kind of sacrificial plants so that um, they will attract the bugs away from your crops um, nasturtiums are particularly good for this um, so if you're growing beans, if you're growing anyone who's grown beans before, green beans, broad beans, you'll know that, um, that black fly absolutely love them. Um, now, if you do pop some nasturtiums in with the mix, then they will attract the black fly. Um, so it will just sort of move the colony over to there. And also you will get to enjoy some really delicious nasturtium flowers, which are also edible and really peppery and lovely. So I'd recommend giving that a go. That kind of leads nicely into the next question we had from Eleanor, which is, what are your favourite edible flowers? Mm. That's a nice, uh, unexpected link. Lovely. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely tie-in, yeah. Um, I have to say nasturtiums are definitely one of my favourite edible flowers. I think they are so delicious, but I'm a real fan of really um, like quite peppery salad leaves. Like I love rocket and all those kind of flavours. Um, other great edible flowers, um, yeah, the borrowed flowers that I was recommending earlier, I think they just look absolutely beautiful in a salad and they're really tasty and also good in the ice cubes. Um, you can eat, um, I think, I, I think that marigold flowers are edible, but you have to get the right variety. So it's just a case of checking that you've got the right one. Um, I would say before you um, do eat any of your flowers, do make sure that they are edible. <laughs> um, do check online if you're not feeling too sure. Um, it's always a good idea. Well, we, we do a lot of wild food in the cemetery park and flowers are are always very popular with people mm. and um I, I live i live by the uh, phrase never munch on a hunch so yeah. uh, <laughs> if in doubt if in doubt leave it out so yeah That's but it. you know the dandelion, dandelions are very edible um, they are the petals of dandelions daisies are really edible too yeah so, uh, and they've got a kind of licorice flavor daisies mm. they're really quite interesting so um, if you, there's the famous ivy restaurant in london that lots of celebrities are said to frequent and the chef there always puts a sprig of ivy leaf toad flax on every dish which is a Lovely. very small um snapdragony looking flower mm. um, but yeah there's lots of flowers out there that are edible but do do, do avoid yeah. buttercups because um they're, they're quite they do hurt you i think the yeah. pollen contains a cyanide compound which will make you vomit mm. Mm. um little viola flowers look yes. absolutely beautiful in salads and on, as a topping yeah. on any of your dishes as well i think there's so pretty again like check the variety make sure that yeah. everything's edible and everything's fine but violas are very commonly used if you go out for dinner and they use yeah. edible flowers um they're commonly used and if you're growing herbs in your garden as well i really recommend growing chives because you can eat the chive flowers and i think they're also really gorgeous and have a really delicious flavor um as does wild garlic flowers i think they're really divine they just carry that flavor out of the leaves and um yeah i think they look wonderful <laughs> Certainly, the, and the rocket flowers are really tasty as well um they're really delicious. good they're really sweet with their kind of peppery aftertaste um, but yes there's lots out there the, the world is your oyster when it comes to eating flowers um and yes. then we've got um a question from Jay. I'll read it out as he's written it so I don't I don't say it wrong. So he's put I've always used evergreen herbs scattered in my landscape in like oregano, bay leaf, sage, sage, thyme, mint, and rosemary, and even some edible wildflowers. This was in Texas. Are these herbs also evergreen in London? Do you have a, have evergreen herb suggestions or alternatives that are more appropriate for the UK? Hmm. Okay. So um in the UK, are the herbs that we grow, a lot of them are herbaceous perennials, which means that they will um, definitely come back the next year. And some of them, if it's a herbaceous perennial, it will kind of die back 
um, in the winter time and then come uh, through with loads of fresh delicious foliage in the new in the springtime um, I mean, I'm, I would really recommend uh, for your garden growing, like lemon verbena is absolutely beautiful. You can give it like a really hard um, cut back to about a third of its size um, at, at sort of late in the winter, and then it will come through with beautiful fresh growth. And I don't know if anyone's tried lemon verbena, but it's got the most incredible um, lemon sherbet flavor, which is just wonderful. And of course, um, you know, things like, oregano as um as you mentioned um thyme marjoram chives all of these beautiful herbs they will keep coming back every year rosemary will will just keep growing year on year as well and you'll get wonderful flowers which will be covered in bees in this country as well which is just delightful um and i definitely recommend getting as many lavenders into your garden for that purpose as well um i've got lots of lavender in my garden they're absolutely covered in bees at the moment um yeah um so yeah most of our most of our um herbs will be um will come back the next year wouldn't necessarily say they were evergreen because they might not last through the winter but you'll they'll come back the following year with new growth for you excellent and then my colleague susanna has posted a link to carnivorous plants it's something i grow at home and uh, yeah, a number of them you can plant out in the garden, especially some of the North American pitcher plant varieties. And they're really hardy. They're really good. Anyway, um, and then uh, Jim's asked another question. He's asked if you've ever grown mini cucumbers in containers. Is this um, cucumelons or mini cucumbers, just to clarify? Um, so I haven't grown either, but um, just for... So with cucumbers, you should, if you've got a really sunny spot, you should have good success in, um, in your garden in containers. It shouldn't be a problem. Um, if you have a greenhouse, even better. I definitely recommend um, starting them off inside. They need that warmth for quite a long time to get them going. And then you can get them outdoors as long as we've got a good, nice, hot summer. Um, now, cucumelons um, are, I'm just going to mention these because when he said, mini cucumbers it just makes me think of these they they actually look like um teeny tiny watermelons but they taste of cucumber with lime and um they're just wonderful and they grow really really well in this country in containers as well they're a training vine i think from um central america i think um and they're a really wonderful thing to try as well they're kind of grape sized um fruits and yeah just something a bit different to add to your salads you'll probably end up picking loads of them when you're in the garden because they're just so tasty um and i think really cool for putting in like a gin and tonic or or a virgin version <laughs> yeah really lovely um yeah susanna's grown both those cucumbers you mentioned and cucumelons and, oh, uh, and then someone's saying they've grown cucumelons outside and then there's a bunch of emojis but i, I don't I don't know whether they're, they, they're meant to mean what they look like to me. So <laughs> there's a face palm in there and something looks like licking lips and an angry one. But that, that may just be the interpretation of this chat system. Um, and then Joe said, a few sunflowers have popped up in my veg patch. Would you recommend pulling them up or leaving them? Also, how do you know when spring onions and regular onions are ready to harvest? So two questions yeah. Cool. So um, with the sunflowers, um, it all depends. As far as whether you pull them up or not, it all depends on how much space you've got in the patch. If they're going to um, take over um, a space that you really need for something else that you're growing in there, then maybe it would be a good idea to move them. Um, like I was talking about earlier, it's really good with your garden just to with your vegetable patch just to really think about spacing make sure things have got space to grow together um sunflowers you know they're going to get as long as it's not a, a short bush variety they're going to get pretty tall and you're not going to have too much foliage down at the bottom so you should be okay space wise um yeah so it's all about your space and and if you want them in there as well i would keep them <laughs> if you've got space that sounds lovely i love sunflowers um but yeah if if not try and transplant them really carefully into another nice sunny spot and just really take care of them for a good few days to make sure that they sort of settle in okay um 
And your second question was about when you know if spring onions and uh, okay, other onions onion. are ready. Yep. Is that right? Yeah. Um, cool. So with your spring onions, you um, so I've I, funnily enough, I've not grown onions myself before, but um, you should, I think, I believe you should have them kind of, um, they should start sort of popping out of the surface. I mean, you're going to have lots of the foliage on top, but then you should start seeing like um, a good sized vegetable under the ground. Um, and as I, as I remember, when you pull them out, you need to kind of dry them out. They like a bit of sun drying for a little bit. Um, and then with your um, then with your spring onions, sorry, losing my train of thought. Um, with your spring onions, yeah, once they, I think once they get to a decent size, probably about thirty centimeters, then I think you should be you should be absolutely fine to go for it. Excellent, thank you. And then uh, Michelle Thornhills asked, "I'm growing a cucumelon outside too, like Eleanor. Will it fruit in the first year?" Oh, um, as far as I understand, they should fruit. Um, I really tried hard to get hold of cucumelon seeds this year. Um, I, um, yeah, I went online and it was just as lockdown was kind of coming in, it became really, really difficult to find seeds for anything. Um, so I didn't manage to get any seeds, but everything that I'd read about them said that you should have success in the first year, you should be fine. Um, and as I understand it, you should get your fruit on the vines from about July until um, the first frosts. So you have this really long fruiting season, which is um, really exciting and quite unusual as well. Um, so you should enjoy it for a long season. And my, colleague, my, my colleague Susanna's <laughs> nodding away because I know she's grown a cucumelon, so she was agreeing with everything you were saying there. So oh, cool. um, that <laughs> that's good. <laughs> Great. Um, and then, and then, yeah, go for it. And then, what else have we got here? Oh, I've just lost my questions there. And then any advice on resources from Eleanor Moss, any advice on resources to help plan a new allotment? I have applied for one and I'm on a waiting list. Oh, that's exciting. Um, yeah, I'm happy for you that you're going to get one hopefully soon. I hope your wait isn't too long. Um, so for planning your plot, um, it if think about how much space you've got i know that when you get um, an allotment plot you can choose whether you're going to have like a quarter plot or a half plot or a whole plot um depending on how adventurous you're going to be with it um i really recommend if you can getting um some raised beds into the mix um it will just make it really easy for you to manage the beds for a start but second of all it's much better for pest defense you can use like um, copper tape around the sides to um, help stop the slug problems um, and things like this which is really fun and it helps like sort of keep the soil really warm really early on as well which is fabulous um, now if it depends on what time of year you um, are granted access to your allotment as to what you would get started with doing um, now if you're um, given access to it quite late in the year then you can be thinking about what you want to do in the spring and you can prepare your beds. So come around October, November time, that's a really good time to like dig over your um, soil um, and apply uh, a good mulch. Um, you can add um, like a, sh a sh sheet of sort of weed, uh, like a sort of black sheet so that it stops the weeds coming up can be quite good if you're just kind of putting the plot to bed over the winter time. Um, and yeah just start thinking as i said before like you know start start thinking about what you want to grow start making a list of what crops would really really suit you well um think about um, how how much maintenance will be involved think about how many times you're going to be able to visit your plot each week if it's just like quite a low maintenance one then choose things that are going to be quite easy and that will really look after themselves and yeah i really recommend like plotting it out on paper how you want to do it um, if you do have um let's say you you created like four beds um you can grow your crops on rotation as well um which can be quite nice a uh, way of making use of the nutrients the plants from the previous year have put into the soil so for example if you grow beans in one patch um, they're really fantastic for fixing nitrogen into the soil so if you have crops that um, 
would really appreciate more nitrogen, love a nitrogen feed, then the next year it'd be great to get them into that plot that had the beans in and really make use of the really healthy nitrogen rich soil there. So it's just a case of take your time with it, make your plan, think about where you want to space things, but yeah, really have fun with it. Um, I've had an allotment before. I, I now just have my garden where I grow my food, but I have had an allotment before and it's just been the most fun. It's been the best project. I've just enjoyed getting down there and seeing my plants and watering everything and really taking care of it through the seasons. It's a really joyful experience. So yeah, have a good time with it. <laughs> That sounds lovely. The, the cuckoo melon's creating more conversation. So, um, oh, Ellen great. Moss has said, uh, and apparently it creates a tuber that if you keep in the soil will create a new plant for next year. So that's nice. interesting. I like Ooh, the idea of great. that. And I have to look for seeds again. Um, and then Susanna said, I think you can treat them like dahlias over winter. So you can keep the root either well mulched or dry it over winter. Failing that, I've eaten the tuber and it's delicious. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I know, I know Susanna's a big fan of Cucumella. So she apologises oh. for that as well. She Excellent. Yeah, she's, uh, they're brilliant. <laughs> and you can also eat daily tub tubers as well. You can, um, yeah. yeah. And then and then Joe's asked, what's the normal time between the red flowers on my beans and the harvest? They're currently flowering and have been for a few weeks, but don't mm -hmm. seem to be turning into beans. I think they're runner beans climbing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it shouldn't be too long, actually. Uh, we're at the end of July now, um, so yeah, just hold on. You, you'll, I mean, you, you'll know as someone who is growing your beans how quickly they grow. Um, you know, you'll come out there one day and you will see the tiny beans will start um, establishing. So it shouldn't be too long now, especially if they've been flowering for a little while. Excellent. And then uh, just a nice thank you for you here, Sarah. So someone, um, Amanda, she, uh, Am Amani, I think, you, oh, Amani, you might say her name, has uh, left that to leave the talk. So she thought, thank you so much for this wonderful session. I'm afraid I have to shoot off to a class, so we'll miss the rest of the talk. I'll certainly keep my eye out for future talks, and my husband and I are hoping to visit the cemetery park this weekend. Um, and uh, then Joe's responded to your answer on the runner beans. Phew! With a smiley uh, face. <laughs> <laughs> Great. <laughs> So um, that's reached the end of the chat. If anyone would like to turn off their microphones and ask questions in person, feel free to do that. Um, are there any final things you'd like to say, Sarah, while we see if anyone does that? Um, just thanks for all your questions so far. Like I welcome any, any more that you have. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll try my best with answering them. <laughs> I won't have all the answers, but I'll do my best. <laughs> I think mean, I think you've done fabulous. It's been oh, I, I'm you. learning lots while I'm here as well. Because so, I, I you know I manage a cemetery park. But I don't really grow fruit and veg. So over the lockdown, I did build a raised bed and I, you know, yeah. threw loads of spinach and and what else did I throw in? Lettuce. They did really well. That was super easy. <laughs> Just throw right. spinach and lettuce in, and I had more than I knew what to do with, and I did very little to look after them. But the, the corn. <laughs> yeah. Um, my colleague Susanna gave me some corn seeds. She gave me ten. Two of the ten germinated. So I bought a bunch of, I bought six plants from eBay that were kind of germinated and four of those have survived, but they're much smaller than the original two. So um, yeah, I'm, I, I've got fond memories of my parents growing corn. So I wanted to try it out for myself and it's quite difficult. It shouldn't be. Yeah. It's a staple crop for some people around the world, but I'm really yeah. struggling with it. Uh, it's have you very... ever grown corn? Uh, you know what I've my dad has um and I I I often go up to his allotment with him and he has had like amazing success with his um yeah he's uh, he just everything he grows is just absolutely wonderful I haven't tried growing it myself um yeah because I'm with my back garden I kind of filled it with a whole load of stuff and then no. didn't have any space for corn no, but, well, they're very, they're very yeah good. maybe next year <laughs> I, 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 I have to say Ken it's it's really trial and error with um with growing crops because they're very um it all depends on the soil and how much light you have and what's growing near them and everything so it's every garden will be different and just because um in one garden there's success with it doesn't yeah. mean that there'll be success in another one so some things will do well, some things not so much. But that's yeah. all part of the part of the fun as well, I think, is just is. having a go. Uh, <laughs> it certainly is, and I've in, I've enjoyed yeah. the experience. And the, the fantasy in my raised bed was to have wildflowers and corn growing together. But the wildflowers went pop, 
and they've nearly finished and the corn's still going, it's like, okay, that hasn't quite worked. The image in my mind of a, of a corn field with wildflowers didn't quite happen. But anyway, I'll try something different next year. Um, we got a uh, uh, that, as I said, ask massive thanks for the talk. Um, love from one of the TVA Massive, that's the virtual allotment people, I think, in, El in Eltham. Um, and Barry, want, Barry's trying to say something. Go for it, Barry. Can I just ask for an opinion? Go okay, for it. Smallish Garden, about seven or eight years ago, I had a lot of success. Everything from carrots, rhubarb, fruit to potatoes, in between the shrubs. And someone put me right off, I had a lot of success, ate a lot, and someone put me right off that year by telling me that the lead in the air in London gets into the soil and you can poison yourself eating the food from the garden, so I didn't grow anymore. Oh no! They said the air pollution is so bad from the cars, it gets into the soil. I'm just asking your opinion, is it true? Or well, I, I wouldn't be able to say if, if it was true or not, but um, I, I mean, I, I live in Richmond and yeah, there's certainly um, probably a, an issue with air pollution here. We've got airplanes going over <laughs> quite a lot. Um, like I grow completely organically um, and so I do the best I can with um, the way that things are. I think, um, I don't know, I think, I think it, with our food growing you know we 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 buy our, buy our food from supermarkets or from farmers markets and we grow what we can and you know we we seem to be keeping in relatively good health hopefully everybody um and i think it is just a case of we just we just have to do what we can do um so you know avoiding chemicals and pesticides in your garden is going to be a really really great help unfortunately with the airplanes it is something that is just there which i'm sure all of us would be um grateful if air pollution wasn't such a huge problem it's one of the biggest just big problems of our time isn't it it's such a terrible shame but i wouldn't be put off barry to trying to grow your own really like i would I would still, I would still give it a go because you know I think I think you've got to kind of weigh weigh up you know what you get from the experience, and if you are growing organically as well, you're doing your very best with it, and you're going to be getting all those fantastic nutrients from what you're growing, which is only going to do you good as well. So I say keep growing. <laughs> um, what washing and cooking gets rid of most things, and uh, so. It's a, yes. yeah. And if you're, if you're bringing in your own compost and raised beds, that helps create a barrier between that and anything in the ground. And yeah, yes, plants, you know, they like simple and inorganic things. So uh, it's hard for them to take up things like lead, but it could sit on the surface of the leaf. And so we have wash, yeah. let it wash and cook, which will help. Um, but anyway, another thank you for this session from uh, Michelle Thornhill. Found it very informative. Ian's um, asked something. He said, apologies if this was covered before I join. I have a roof terrace and grow everything in containers, obviously. Great. I've managed moderately with self-pollinating plants, but I'm struggling to grow cucumbers and the likes, chilies, etc. Mm -hmm. I've planted flowers to attract pollinators, but I never see any bees or butterflies. So, um, thoughts on that? Okay. Um, I wonder if it has anything to do with um how high up you are i'm not sure how what floor you're on as as regards to where your roof garden is um i don't know if you're if you're really really high up if you're in a flat then that may, might make a, a difference potentially for um the wildlife getting up there um but yeah i i'd say um for attracting your pollinators yeah just just persist like do do keep trying um to incorporate um uh, beneficial plants for wildlife you know really nectar rich um, flowers um, which they will really appreciate and you can also incorporate things like um, uh, you know like bee houses and things like this which will really really help you you know for solitary bees you're going to be providing a, a habitat for them um, which can be quite helpful as well another way of drawing in your pollinators um, yeah you want to be also um, for natural pest events, you would want to be attracting things like ladybirds um, and lace wings are really fantastic. So the insect houses can be quite useful also for this. Um, but yeah, do try and get maybe just max out um, uh, the the beneficial flowers, you know, the really nectar pollen rich flowers. Um, and as far as um, if you 
if you don't have success with things that need pollinating in order to fruit then maybe next year try to choose um self-pollinating varieties there's plenty out there um if you can't find them in your garden center then have a good look online a lot of um sort of your regular suppliers will um provide a uh, huge list of plants um so yeah self-pollinating varieties for like fruits and maybe for things like cucumbers and chilies i'm not sure but it'd be worth checking um and that might just help you out and help you overcome that problem can you could you pollinate things yourself with a paintbrush is that something you can consider as a gardener with that with that help yeah yeah absolutely absolutely yeah um, yeah. Then we've had several comments going back to Barry's concern about lead in the air. About um, yes, lead was banned in petrol. We don't have we have unleaded petrol now, don't we? So, a few comments on that. Um, yeah, uh, I don't I don't know I don't know if that's someone's. But Ian then wrote fascinatingly: the removal of lead from petrol has been linked to a reduction in violent crimes from the 90s onward. That's an interesting bit of research. There we um, go. I think, yeah, someone said that was based on some US research. There's lots of, it's created a little conversation here in the chat. Sorry, I'm just going through it. Oh, great. Um, yeah, so people just say, unless you're by a busy road, you know, shouldn't need to really worry too much. Mm. Um, and then Susanna, my colleagues, posted a Twitter account for someone called Botany Geek. If you like scientific facts on growing your own, go follow Botany Geek on Twitter. Um, great. So, and then Ian's told us he's on the fourth floor it's not penthouse living right, okay. like he implies <laughs> uh, yeah yeah uh, i I'd, I'd really recommend try next year trying um self-fertile for self-fertile varieties might be um a good way to go if you're struggling with it um and then joe's i'll read what joe's put he said i grew what was labeled as butternut squash so far i've got one big plant that's producing yellow yellow courgettes and the others are trailing a long stem that's creeping along the ground, big yellow flowers that bees love, and a couple of round-shaped green vegetable about the size of a tennis ball. Do you think these will become squash? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I haven't grown butternut squash myself before, actually, so um, I wouldn't be able to say for sure um yeah might be a case of just wait and see what happens um <laughs> yeah, correct. get, get yeah. some pictures and um find some discussion online and see if someone can help you that's it um, yeah absolutely otherwise you might end up with some lovely round um courgettes which i really love as well um <laughs> which is always good it's not squash but it's something <laughs> and he grew them from seed he wants to let us know which is very oh, in its own right growing really things like that yeah. anything growing from seed is always lovely um and then kate's shared um, an article to some research about lead in the soil so it's there but it's not enough to worry about so there we go they help help and barry feel more comfortable to restart his uh, growing. Um, so yes, and so he's, Ian's going to pick up the idea of a bee house. Appreciate you answering. Thank you for that. Okay. And, uh, and then Ke uh, Kevin said, "I wouldn't. We've never heard of cucumber melons, but we're going to give it a go to plant them now." <laughs> Great talk. <laughs> Thanks, Joe from Jackie and Kevin. Yeah, it's, I'm very. I mean, Susanna's quite captured my attention with them, but it, I'm even more excited by them with all the chat this evening. <laughs> Great. Yes. So Joe said he's uh, he's kind of happy to wait and see what what happens with these butternut squash things if they are. Mm. Um, yeah, reach the end of the chat again. Any anything else from anybody? I just wanted to say something. Um, if anyone is local to us, um, we we actually have a compost heap which um, everyone is more than welcome to get compost from. We just would need you to get in touch with us beforehand. I mean, if you are just coming by foot or bike you're just welcome to take from the compost heap just bring your own tools and a bag um, but if you did want to have a, a bigger amount and you needed to do that with a vehicle it would just be good if you could contact us and um, so we can show you where to go and we will just lead you there because we obviously need to think of the health and uh, the safety of everyone else in the park um, but yes if you want to contact us about that you can email us i'm just putting that in the chat now um, and that just might be a great thing if you are thinking about developing your garden or starting your garden. It's completely yes. free. I don't and know get, if I get, 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 get in quick with the compost because uh, 12 lorry loads are going to be taken away in mid-August. 
they go into a primary school somewhere in London. So oh, that's, that's 16 tons a load. So, wow. yeah, so is, we might empty our heap for the first time ever, which will be amazing. Um, and so, yes, Cucamelon uh, has been my main takeaway from this, particularly in a G&T. Ah, um, great. <laughs> um, and, then, and then Eleanor's just received some borage seeds. Should she wait until September to sow them? Um, so, yeah, wildflower sowing time is, you, um, as I said earlier, uh, September would be your next growing season. However, um, on your seed packet, it should tell you the sowing times of this particular flower um so yeah just always check the packet and it will let you know when you can get them in the ground and, and jo joe's saying he planted some borage seeds about a month ago and they're growing really quickly and they're almost coming into flower so um amazing yeah, they can move on very quickly when when the conditions are right yeah mm -hmm. they're a great bee plant again as well so really cool if you're trying to get more more um pollinators into your garden yeah definitely excellent any last things no it's all gone very quiet well i think we've probably reached a natural stopping point sarah so from nice. myself and the rest of the friends and michelle and Susanna as well can i just say thank you for um taking part and being part of so much park online and helping us keep the friends all alive during this um during this kind of unusual bizarre times but it's been an absolute pleasure i've learned loads um everyone's got very excited about cuckoo melons which is lovely because they're <laughs> cute in their own right and um yeah so I, I've, we've shared your your website and so you know, thank people you. can get in touch with you and find out more about you but it's been absolutely wonderful so thank you very much and thank you everybody for joining us this evening and um having a lively discussion with us all